Good day. On Friday, 19th February 2021, US President Joe Biden addressed the leaders of the Western Alliance um, at the Munich Security Conference, which this time was held in a virtual format because of the on ongoing pandemic. So he spoke to these leaders, which was his first time to address the leaders of the Western Alliance and, of course, um, other leaders of that alliance like Angela Merkel of Germany and Emmanuel Macron of France were also there. This was um, Joe Biden's first attempt to speak or first opportunity to speak directly to the leadership of the Western Alliance in a format where they were all of them or most of them gathered. You'll find a link to his remarks under this video. Now, there's a few points I would like to make first, which is that um, one of the strange things about this transcript, for me, one of the rather disturbing things about this transcript is that it actually highlights points in the address where Biden actually made mistakes. For example, he fluffed the word vision at one point in his speech and said um, um, division instead, used the word division instead. At another point, he said reflective when he meant reflexive. Well, we know that Joe Biden does fluff his words from time to time, and world leaders also do that. It's He's not the only one who has done that, though perhaps he does it more than most. But what I did find extremely strange, and in my experience completely unprecedented, is that this White House transcript um, actually highlights those errors. You have the word that Biden actually said, D division in one place, um, reflective in another, with a line going through it, and then you have the word he should have used, um, vision and reflexive, following directly after. It's almost as if someone in the White House wanted to highlight the fact that Joe Biden slips and uh, blunders from time to time um, in the words he uses and uses words different from the ones he intended to use. I, I have to say that seems remarkable to me in every other case where I know in a, a speech of a world leader produced by his own office would edit out and correct those mistakes. Of course, this has happened shortly after the vice president, Kamala Harris, had uh, discussions with other world leaders, notably Emmanuel Macron of France and Justin Trudeau, which as Alex Christoforou and I discussed in a recent programme, uh, for the Duran, give the clear impression of having been made in, a, in the capacity of an acting president. So, Maybe, maybe these corrections of Biden's uh, words and the fact that the transcript highlights the fact that those corrections were made once again is intended by someone to emphasise, shall we say, Biden's lapses rather than, if you like, to draw attention away from them. I'm not going to say more about this, but I do find it unusual and worth mentioning. But what about the comments themselves? Well, the first thing to say about them is that this is an incredibly boring speech. I mean, you that's probably why you will notice that there's very little actual mention or commentary about it in the media. It's a very boring speech, and it gave very much the impression that it had been written by a committee. Um, in other words, it was various ideas or perhaps I should say various cliches cobbled together to form a speech which as a result had no overarching message and had very little structure behind it. Um, various commentators have attempted to highlight 
Um, what they claim is a difference between this speech and Donald Trump's approach when he was president. Supposedly, Joe Biden emphasized the collegiality of the NATO alliance and uh, reassured uh, Western leaders, other Western leaders, of the US's commitment to that alliance. What I will say about that is that that actually is an attack on a straw man. It's a straw man argument because in reality, Donald Trump did not take any step which actually undermined the NATO alliance in any significant way. On the contrary, the United States uh, recommitted itself even further to uh, NATO whilst he was president, transferring more troops further eastwards to Poland and the Baltic states, bringing them even closer to Russia's borders. So this narrative that has been constructed of Donald Trump seeking to undermine NATO is a completely false one and should not be taken seriously by any commentator. I'm afraid it's one of those one of those commentaries about Donald Trump, which is regularly peddled, has now achieved a kind of reality which the facts itself simply don't justify or warrant. Other than that, Joe Biden actually had very little to say. He did talk very much a lot about China. He talked about China um, and the United States being in stiff competition with each other. He was critical of Chinese governance practices, uh, uh, particularly business government pra governance practices. This is all very common and usual stuff. It doesn't really imply any real attempt on the part of the United States to reign in China or to do very much about China. He also made some comments about Russia. And here I would say there was a great deal of attention given to what he would say about Russia in the run up to his speech in certain places. There were predictions that Joe Biden would make some really harsh and strong comments about Russia. What did he actually say? Well, I'm going to actually quote his exact words. These are his words in his speech about Russia. They are as follows. Um, uh, you know, this is also this is also how we're going to be able to meet the threat from Russia. The Kremlin attacks our democracies and weaponizes corruption to try to undermine our system of governance. Russian leaders want people to think that our system is more corrupt or as corrupt as theirs. But the world knows that isn't true, including Russians. Russia's own citizens. Putin seeks to Euro weaken European, the European project and our NATO alliance. He wants to undermine the transatlantic unity and our resolve because it's so much easier for the Kremlin to bully and threaten individual states than it is to negotiate with a strong and closely united transatlantic community. That's why, that's why standing up for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine remains a vital, America, vital concern for Europe and the United States. That's why addressing recklessness, Russian le recklessness, and hacking into computer wet networks in the United States and across Europe and the world has become critical to protecting our collective security. The challenges with Russia may be different than the ones with China, but they're just as real. And it's not about pitting East against West. It's not about we want a conflict. We want a future where all nations are able to freely determine their own path without a threat of violence or coercion. We cannot and must not return to the reflexive that's where he used the word reflective, by the way, reflexive opposition and rigid blocks of the Cold War. Cooperation, competition must not lock out cooperation on issues that affect us all. For, uh, for instance, we must cooperate if we're going to defeat the pandemic everywhere. So if you unpack that, 
it's quite clear that what he sees in Russia is not a military threat. He doesn't talk about Russia posing any kind of military threat, as many people claim. He talks about Russia basically as a challenge on the information space. He does talk about Ukraine. He could hardly do otherwise. Uh, but in fact, even there, what he says doesn't really go very far. And when he talks about not wanting confrontation or a return to the Cold War, in fact, he's holding open the door for future cooperation with the Russians, as he did with the Chinese. I'm going to add, by the way, that in my opinion, all these points about Russia being a uh, challenge or a threat in terms of information space actually make us understand better what the real purpose of building up this Russian so-called threat really is. It is part of the long-standing agenda of um, challenging anybody who criticises issues like, say, corruption in the West and claiming that they're acting on the basis of Russian disinformation. So it's, in effect, an attempt to control narratives within the, re the West rather than to challenge the Russians directly on any fundamental issue. So we have a bland, unconvincing, uninteresting speech from Biden with no real content, no real substance, no real indication of anything that he or his administration is going to do. Comments about China as you know a country that engages in stiff competition and criticism of its opaque business practices. Comments about Russia and the way it supposedly weaponizes information in order to foster ideas that Western countries are corrupt. But no real program, no actual program of action. And in fact, we saw very little of that altogether from the Biden administration in general over the last few days. There have been consultations within NATO. Um, there's been talk about reformatting NATO in some form or in some way. It's not entirely clear what this means, but it does seem as if the pressure that was constantly coming from Donald Trump onto the Europeans to get the Europeans to, to uh, pay more for their NATO membership by increasing their own defence spending, it seems that that's going to slacken. Instead, the policy, or rather the intention, seems to be to try to get the Europeans, or at least the NATO uh, members in Europe, to contribute to American military activities in the Asian region and, again, probably in places like Afghanistan. Um, I'm not sure how the Europeans will respond to that, but they will certainly respond with pleasure to the fact that Donald Trump's pressure on them to increase defence spending, it seems, is going to go away. But nothing here in these speech or in these comments or indeed in all the other discussions that suggest what uh, Joe Biden has really been talking about, which is an America that's coming back and is intervening actively once more in world affairs. What you get from all of these comments is overall a general sense of drift of an administration where nobody is in charge, where there are different people pursuing competing agendas, and where, and where, when difficult problems appear over the horizon, like, for example, the question of uh, um, uh, the US semiconductor industry, where there's been a request from the industry to do something to, uh, uh, to reduce uh, U.S. dependence on Taiwan and China for microchips. The response is not to actually do anything, but to set up a commission of inquiry to look into the problem and to provide an answer. Well, nobody knows quite when, but at some point in the indefinite future. 
Um, Biden's response to almost every issue seems to be to kick it into a commission of inquiry and to wait for one day for some kind of answer to come back, by which point, no doubt, he hopes that the problem will have gone away or attention in it will have slackened. So, an America that has far from come back, an America that is drifting. Um, it's a good question how far this can continue. Um, Alex Christoforo and I have just done a programme on the Duran, in fact it was a live stream, in which we discussed how the United States, or at least certain elements within the United States appear to be pushing the United States into once more rather reckless moves in the Middle East. There's been complaints from some quarters about the failure of the Biden administration, for example, to engage effectively and diplomatically with Iran with the way to with with the, the intention of taking the United States back into the JCPOA. In reality, it seems to me, the failure of the Biden administration to sort out its policies with Iran and to move forward in any purposeful way with those uh, uh, relations with Iran is consistent with pretty much everything else. Drift in Europe, drift in the Middle East, unfortunately a drift there towards conflict and war, drift in the Far East with no real coherent policy towards China, a drift in relations towards Russia, where there seems to be an attempt to sort of both demonise the Russians and cooperate with them on various issues at one and the same time, an unsustainable position, if ever there was one. All of this reflecting a drift within the United States on many issues of domestic policy also. I wonder how long this can continue, because I am sure it cannot continue for very long. A crisis, either within the domestic economy or in the international sphere, is bound to come up soon. At that point, a government, a purposeful government, is needed in Washington. At the moment, it doesn't seem like Washington or the United States has one. Thank you for joining me for this programme. Thank you uh, um, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, looking up our other programmes on the Duran, uh, Alex Christoforo's channel, which you'll find links for under this video. Please check us out on our other platforms, BitChute, Library, Odyssey, Rumble, and all the rest. Please also support us through PayPal, Patreon, Subscribestar, and via Bitcoin. Also check out our shop where you find great things like our famous Duran Magic mugs, our t-shirts like the one I'm wearing at the moment, our, um, our um, hats and hoodies and sweatshirts. And I look forward to you joining me in my next program um, and have a great day.